Bob, thanks very much. And uh, Bob's right, we have worked together in the past. We consider him an honorary Ohioan, having <laughs> spent some time at Oberlin. And uh, it's always good to be with him. He worked for Barry McCaffrey, who was our drug czar for a while. And he's worked for Republicans and Democrats on the drug issue. And he has been an advocate for not the current uh, approach to uh, drug abuse and addiction, but rather one that focuses more on prevention, education, and treatment and recovery. And I think um, this is one of the issues that, although we're not going to talk about directly today, it's an example of something on the discretionary part of the budget that is getting squeezed more and more as we don't deal with the larger problem on the mandatory spending side of the budget. And uh, so as we're talking about that, maybe sort of keep in mind that's an example of um, a program, for instance, like the Second Chance Act that we're trying to get reauthorized right now that I authored 10 years ago that's on the discretionary side that's under more and more budget, budget pressure, even though it actually is a uh, program that is not a top-down Washington program, and it actually saves money because it encourages uh, states and localities to put in place prisoner reentry programs that keeps people out of this revolving door of prison. And in fact, it encourages and has been very successful in getting people into productive lives where they're taxpayers and, and taking care of their, their families, and uh, of course, better for our communities, but also better for the taxpayer. So just an example, Bob, of the kind of things that we've been working on over the years that uh, I fear is going to be under increasing pressure if we don't do something about the bigger problem in, in our budget. This is a nice turnout. I'm glad you're here. I would have come Thursday if I were you. Um, and I'll tell you why. I looked at the website for the National Press Club, and the description for today is basically come here to budget wonks, talk about the intricacies of budget baselines, whereas on Thursday it's Marion Barry's event, and uh, here's what it says about this. This is a direct quote. No nationally is a disgraced mayor caught on camera smoking crack cocaine in a downtown hotel room with a mistress. Marion Barry Jr. has led a controversial career, and he will be here on Thursday. So um, I don't know why you're here, but thank you for coming. Um, you can always make Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, Van Holland. Maybe, maybe the tubas could make this more, more interesting. Uh, no, we got to stick to budget stuff. That's what we're, that's what we're supposed to do. Um, Look, I, I worked with Chris a lot over the years. We were on the so-called super committee together, which ended up being not so super. Um, but it was a serious effort on behalf of some of us on that committee to try to find answers. Uh, we were not ultimately successful, although, in fact, some of what we proposed, uh, you could argue, later happened through sequestration. And, and um, what we really didn't get at was, again, this broader picture of how do you deal with the biggest part of the budget, uh, now two-thirds of the budget, which is called mandatory spending. Within 10 years, the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office tells us that will be three quarters of the budget. And um, so it's the fastest growing part and the biggest part of the budget. And, and so we have our work cut out for us. But um, again, Chris Van Hollen and I have had the opportunity to work together before. And I hope we'll have the opportunity to work together in the future uh, to try to find common ground on, on this and other issues. Um, this debt that we currently have and the deficit uh, is very serious and threatening to our economy. Erskine Bowles uh, has said uh, it's the most predictable economic crisis in our history. And, and, and I agree with him. Um, the, the deficits are projected to top $1 trillion within the next decade. And yet it seems like it's off the headlines. <laughs> and I want to thank the National Press Club for having this, because um, by shining a light on it today and asking us to be here, it shows that uh, at least they believe that this continues to be an important issue, and we ought to be talking about it more. Um, some have suggested, as you know, that because the deficit is only about $500 billion this year, that that's okay. And uh, first of all, $500 billion doesn't seem okay to me. Um, when I was at the Office of Management and Budget, uh, Bob mentioned that the deficit was $161 billion. I thought it was way too high. And that's why we proposed a balanced budget over a five-year period. Um, so I think $500 billion is certainly not solving the problem, but it's also way too high because um, we are looking at, again, trillion dollar deficits within a decade. And that's based on the Congressional Budget Office analysis. Um, it's due, by the way, entirely to the costs on the mandatory side of the budget, um, the vital but unsustainable entitlement programs. I'll talk about that in a, in a second. And by the way, it's a pretty rosy scenario when you assume a trillion dollars uh, a year in deficits a decade from now. It assumes no wars. It assumes no recessions. Um, it assumes no terrorist tax. It assumes interest rates are going to stay um, at relatively low rates, in fact, historically low rates over that period of time. 
So there's a lot of danger that the deficits could, in fact, be, be far higher than that. Um, CBO projects a $10 trillion increase in debt over the next decade. So you go from roughly $17 trillion where we are today, at the end of this year it will be $17.7 trillion, to $27 trillion in debt 10 years from now. Again, relatively rosy scenario. So I hope nobody's declaring victory. And I hope we continue to keep this very much on the front burner and talk about how do we solve this problem. Um, and the problem driving the debt is entitlement spending. Um, I do think most folks on both sides of the aisle now understand that, so I won't spend a lot of time talking about the math. Um, I don't think it's a big mystery. I don't think it's a matter of ideology or point of view. I think it is a matter of arithmetic. Um, the numbers are simply overwhelming. Social Security, health entitlements, net interest comprise just over half of the budget, and yet they're responsible for 86 percent of all new spending over the next decade. Entitlement spending is set to double over the next decade. Uh, it will consume almost 100 percent of tax revenues within a decade. In other words, the entire discretionary budget uh, from defense to health research to education to the Second Chance Act we talked about, um, infrastructure, all of that will have to be funded through the nation's credit card because every penny of revenue coming in will have to be used to pay for this expanding entitlement spending. Again, over 100 percent increase on the entitlement side. So what do we do? Well, we've got to act. We've got to do something to save these vital, as I said, but unsustainable programs. And um, if, we, if we don't, you know, we're, we're, we're not serving the very people who rely on them. Social Security already faces a $62 billion deficit this year. So folks would say Social Security is in fine shape. Uh, the cash deficit would be about six, another $62 billion more going out in terms of benefits than are coming in in terms of payroll taxes this year. Um, the primary trust fund, the old age trust fund, will go bankrupt in just over 20 years, which when you think about it, uh, we're now at a point where those who are retiring today, uh, most will be alive at a time when the Social Security trust fund goes belly up. And as you all know, under law, that means a 25 percent cut in benefits unless we change the law. So this is happening, um, you know, now to folks who are currently uh, moving from work into retirement. Social Security Disability Trust Fund uh, goes bankrupt in 2017, just around the corner. Uh, the Medicare Trust Fund uh, in just over a decade. So obviously these programs need to be modernized, need to be reformed, and the longer we wait, the more painful those reforms will be. If we're going to do it, of course, um, uh, we're going to have to take some tough steps. And it's going to take reaching across the aisle, and it's going to take both parties being involved. And uh, just as was done back in the 1980s, the last time this was done with Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill, uh, each party is going to have to be involved, in my view. There are um, a lot of myths about spending and entitlements and deficits, so let me attempt, uh, at least from my perspective, to clear the air here today. Um, I'm going to touch on five of what I think are the most uh, persistent myths out there that help uh, to keep us from doing this important work, finding common ground and finding a solution. Myth one, declining tax revenues are the problem. Um, Foghorn Leghorn used to say in the cartoons, uh, that's mathematics, son. And uh, I, I think it is. He says, you know, you can argue with me, but you can't argue with figures. Uh, since 1960, tax revenues, regardless of what the tax policy was, have stayed around 18 percent of GDP. So that's been the average, you know, since the 60s. That's about to change. CBO projects that revenues will exceed the historical average starting next year and over the next few decades soar to the highest levels ever as a percent of the economy. Of course, the highest levels in terms of nominal tax uh, easily, but I'm talking about percent of the economy. More specifically, individual revenues as a percent of the economy uh, will shatter all records in uh, the next decade. So within a decade, it'll be higher than it has been previously. And that's Again, the Congressional Budget Office, uh, not uh, me or some other partisan group. Unfortunately, of course, spending soars even more. So these higher revenues uh, doesn't keep up with the higher spending. Spending is averaged about 20 percent. So revenues about 18, spending about 20. Um, the CBO projects that health spending, net interest costs will drive that spending to 25, 30, and eventually 35 percent of the economy in the coming decades. Uh, CBO used to have a baseline that, that I kind of liked, which is called the alternative baseline, that laid all this out. Um, I think they said that would happen in the, in the 2030s time frame, 
They didn't offer that this last year. I'm sorry they didn't. But regardless, if you look at the numbers and project them out, you, you see that the tax system simply can't keep up with the spending. In fact, you couldn't have an income tax system uh, that collected taxes high enough to keep up with the spending. Um, so I, I guess one way to say it is that CBO projects that entitlement costs and the resulting high interest on the debt, those two things, entitlement costs, high interest on the debt, are responsible for 100 percent of the rising long-term deficits. Even the highest sustained tax revenues in history won't come close to paying for that. Um, if entitlement spending is driving this, then shouldn't the strong majority of deficit reforms come from those programs? Or should we just keep chasing record spending with higher tax levels? Um, again, that's a race we're going to lose because we can't keep up with it eventually. Myth two, Social Security and Medicare recipients receive only what they pay into the system. I hear this a lot. I'm sure Chris does too from our constituents. Uh, for Social Security, that's becoming more true for current retirees. But the typical person retiring into Medicare today uh, will still receive $3 in benefits for every $1 paid into the system. Specifically, a uh, typical two-earner couple retiring today in Ohio or Maryland or anywhere in the country uh, will have paid about $119,000 in lifetime Medicare taxes and premiums, premiums included, yet receive about $357,000 in lifetime Medicare benefits. When you multiply that by uh, about 77 million baby boomers, you can see why the Medicare math doesn't make sense. Myth three, Social Security and Medicare trust funds will shield taxpayers from additional costs. Um, the trust funds are an asset to Social Security, but they're also a liability to the Treasury. So while the Social Security trust fund assures seniors that all Social Security deficits through 2035 will be funded, it doesn't provide any actual economic resources to do it. Um, so the general fund still has to come up with trillions of dollars to fulfill that pledge. In that sense, the existence of the trust fund does not save current or future taxpayers a dime. All future benefits have got to be financed by future taxpayers. During the Clinton administration, the Office of Management and Budget uh, had a quote about this that I thought was um, appropriate. And in a moment of candor, they said these balances are available to finance future benefit payments only in a bookkeeping sense. They do not consist of real economic assets that can be drawn down in the future to fund benefits. Instead, they are claims on the Treasury that when redeemed will have to be financed by raising taxes, borrowing from the public, or reducing benefits or other expenditures. Pretty simple. Uh, and I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about what the trust funds really mean. Myth four, we can tweak our way to fiscal sustainability, making changes around the edges to close the gap. That's just not possible. Again, look at the math. According to their trustees, Social Security and Medicare face a combined $40 trillion unfunded liability over the next 75 years. That's a uh, trillion with a T. Uh, tweaks can't close that gap. You know, the recent expiration of the upper income tax cuts, which uh, the president uh, was uh, committed to, uh, to close, um, raised about $620 billion over the next decade. And um, a lot of folks said that was going to solve the problem. It's a big sum, $620 billion. It's about 3.3 percent of the projected Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid costs over that same period. 3.3 percent, about 1 30th. On um, defense cuts, uh, forget just bringing the troops home. Let's say we could permanently eliminate the entire Department of Defense. It would merely delay the day of budget reckoning by about 15 years. Uh, so there's no plausible set of tax hikes or other spending cuts that could pay for more than a fraction of these entitlement costs. Um, the entitlements themselves require fundamental reform. Myth five, because Obamacare is paid for, that makes it fiscally responsible. Um, again, a new entitlement was started. Some defend uh, Obamacare by saying that it's paid for, at least almost all paid for, uh, by new taxes and Medicare cuts. Um, my view on that is that doesn't make it any more fiscally responsible. I, I, I use example, let's say a family that makes 100000 bucks, and they figure out a way to find $10,000 in savings through hard work, scrounging, belt tightening. And then they take that $10,000 and go to the mall and spend it. Um, I, I don't think they'd say that the spending spree uh, was justified because that $10,000 was paid for. I, I, I think um, we need to look at this in terms of particularly what it does to uh, Medicare. Um, I, I think with regard to Medicare, we can debate whether the Obamacare cuts are appropriate or not. 
CBO has recently said that some of these provider cuts are unsustainable, meaning they won't be sustained by the Congress, uh, or unsustainable in their view under the health care system in our country. But let's take that aside. Let's just assume that it was the right thing to do. Um, the savings from Medicare providers under Obamacare was about $700 billion. If it's appropriate, shouldn't it have been used to deal with this problem with Medicare? And some say, well, you can double count it. Um, it just doesn't make sense. I mean, it was used to, just to uh, fund Obamacare. And otherwise, it could have been available for Medicare reform. So facing these record spending and debt levels uh, in Obamacare, the federal government did scrape together $1.5 trillion in tax increases and Medicare cuts, but then spent the entire amount on a new entitlement program. So this matters because the options for budget savings are really pretty limited. Washington can only raise taxes so high before it does impact the economy in a negative way. Uh, Medicare providers can only be cut so much before they just stop participating in the program. Some have already, as you know. Um, the anti-poverty programs, education programs, veteran spending programs, as well as retirement benefits of the already retired have mostly been taken off the table by Republicans and Democrats. Um, so the options are really pretty limited. Um, there are only so many programs that can be realistically scaled back or eliminated. Is there waste and fraud and abuse in the federal government? Of course and there can be some savings down there, but they pale in comparison to these costs we're talking about. So if Washington keeps using its limited supply of realistic savings to offset expensive new spending, there'll be nothing left for the so-called bargain, even if it's not a grand bargain, at least some, some kind of bargain, to deal with entitlements, save them from bankruptcy, and scale back the debt. Um, the President's budget, uh, $1.2 trillion in new taxes, is used primarily to pay for new spending. Um, the Senate Democrats' preferred tax increase, which is called the Buffett tax, has now been proposed as an offset to nearly a dozen proposed spending hikes. For those of you who follow Congress carefully, you'll recall that this happened again last week. Uh, the Buffett tax was uh, proposed to be used to pay for yet another spending increase, not to reduce the deficit. The Buffett tax um, would close, by the way, less than 1 percent of the budget deficit, or zero, of course, if it keeps being used to offset new spending. Um, it's, um, it's a struggle, frankly, as Chris will uh, acknowledge probably, because we've worked on this together, um, as did Patty Murray and Paul Ryan, to find these savings. Um, so, look, before I close, let, let me just add one, I guess, point. Um, we need to have ideas out there. It's easy to criticize the ideas when they come up. You know, Paul Ryan's budgets get criticized regularly, but they do balance in 10 years. Democrats don't have a alternative that does that. Um, I often uh, talk about means testing in Medicare as an example where we could make a step in the right direction. Does it solve the problems we talked about today? No. But it does take a step in the right direction. It's in the President's budget. Um, it does provide that folks who make over 170000 bucks a year have to pay more in premiums under Part B and Part D of Medicare. It saves about $60 billion in the first 10 years, um, according to uh, the analysis that we have, probably 425 to 450 billion over the next 10 years, which is why it's the kind of proposal we ought to be talking about, because it has this expanding um, benefit to the debt and deficit that we ought to be looking for, because this long-term problem can only be solved by those kinds of reforms. And yet we can't seem to even make progress there. And so my proposal today is, Let's make a commitment at least to take what's in the president's own budget and put that out as a spending reform here, uh, even this year, because it seems to me that's one where we should be able to find bipartisan consensus and take a small step toward dealing with these larger problems. I think success begets success, and we cannot allow the current situation to continue without making some progress. Um, I raised this uh, in the confirmation hearings uh, recently with Sylvia Burwell when she was uh, before our finance committee uh, wanting to move from OMB, I don't blame her, uh, to the health and human services uh, job. And her response was, well, we can't move on that without a balanced approach. And when pushed, the balanced approach is, of course, raising taxes. And it's, of course, raising taxes on upper income Americans, businesses who pay their taxes on an individual level. And I, I understand 
the balance sounds great, but think about this. Think about the logic of this. 